Einen schönen guten Abend. Herzlich willkommen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Studierende, liebe Chandra. My name is Helma Lutz and as the acting director of the Cornelia Goethe Center, I feel very privileged to open this evening. I welcome all of you and in particular our distinguished guest Chandra Mohanty from Syracuse University, New York. When two years ago Angela Davis came back to Frankfurt for the first time in the 46 years after she had left Frankfurt in 1967, for us a dream came true. We had invited her and she accepted and inaugurated the Chair for International Gender and Diversity Studies in her name, which had been established as a guest professorship by the Cornelia Goethe Center. Angela Davis, as many of you may know, is a former or was a former student of our university. From 1965 to 1967, she was participating in the first actions of the then burgeoning student movement in Frankfurt, and she was a PhD student of Horkheimer and Adorno. With her book, Women, Race and Class, published in 1981, she was a pioneer of black women's studies, and she preceded the debate on what we call now intersectionality, at the moment a really important concept in gender studies. Today, as the second holder of the chair, we welcome another pioneer, and it is no coincidence that she's a friend of Angela Davis. Chandra Mohanty's 1984, uh, for the first time published article, Under Western Eyes, is a text that is read by most students of gender studies. It belongs to the canon of feminist studies now. That text, as much as the work that followed, characterizes Chandra Mohanty as a trailblazer of postcolonial studies. We are so delighted to have you here. Also, we are enormously grateful to the following organizations that supported us. And I have to say, without them, we would not have been able to continue the Angela Davis guest professorship because the university is only partly um, supporting uh, this uh, chair. Uh, and I named them in a row. So the, the first is a Deka Bank. The second is a, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is Bankford, and of course we are very happy that a bank has supported us. <laughs> the second is the Cornelia Goethe Center uh, supporters, the Förderkreis um, uh, des Cornelia Goethe Zentrums. Also, the Frankfurt Research Center for Postcolonial Studies um, is supporting us. The Cluster of Excellence Normative Orders uh, supports us. The Hessische Landeszentrale für politische Bildung. The Heinrich Böll Foundation Hessen. The Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the friends and supporters of the Goethe University. Without their generosity, as I said, we would not have, we would be unable to continue our uh, guest professorship and actually um, um, we very much, we are just happy that um, you gave us this. And I think, yeah, a big applause to them. Oh, I forgot one. Uh, Marianne just told me. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the um, what is it? The the um, das Frauenreferat der Stadt Frankfurt. Sorry, leave out the. That is really good. Uh, before I now give the floor to. Professor Nikita Davan, who is the director of the Frankfurt Research Center for Postcolonial Studies, 
and a full professor of uh, gender studies now at Innsbruck University, Austria. Um, she will introduce Chandra and will lead the discussion. I would like to invite all of you to join us after the lecture and the discussion at the reception after this lecture outside of this room. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Helma. Um, before I introduce Chandra, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, my colleagues, my former colleagues at CGC, um, Kira and her team, and my team at FRCPS for all the support. Um, we had this idea almost two years ago. I, I remember approaching Helma while I was still in Frankfurt, and she was very supportive. And then, of course, Kira jumped in. And without the tireless work of all these people, um, it wouldn't have been possible to have Chandra here. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking all of these people. Um, one of the biggest challenges for those of us who seek to transform unjust social, political, and economic relations is to undo the discontinuity between theory production and critical practice. Invariably, we tend to prioritize one at the cost of the other, with the risk of either producing theory that is detached and depoliticized with little relevance to the everyday lives of the disenfranchised and dispossessed. Or reifying experience where self-reflection and self-critique are sacrificed in the urgency of acting here and now. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Dr. Chandra Talpade Mohanty, who is an inspiring example that it is indeed possible to reconcile high theory with radical politics. Born in 1955 in Mumbai, India, Chandra Talpade Mohanty graduated with honors and a BA's degree in English from the University of Delhi in 1974. After graduation, she pursued a master's degree in English in um, 1976 and later attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, from where she earned a master's degree uh, in education, specifically in teaching English in 1980. She continued her education in Illinois, earning a PhD degree in 1987. Currently, Chandra Talpare Mohanty is Distinguished Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Dean's Professor of the Humanities at Syracuse University. She's the author of Feminism Without Borders, Decolonizing Theory, Practicing Solidarity, and a co-editor of Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism, Feminist Gene Genealogies, Colonial Legacies, Democratic Futures, Feminism and War, Confronting U.S. Imperialism, and the Sage Handbook on Identities. Her work has been translated into Arabic, German, Dutch, French, Italian, Spanish, Farsi, Chinese, Russian, Swedish, Thai, Korean, Turkish, Slovenian, Hindi, <laughs> Czech, and Japanese. And I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list. She's a member of the Advisory Board of Science, a journal of women and culture and society. And it's quite ironic because they first refused, they rejected to publish her canonical essay under Western eyes. So talk about the Empire Rights Back. Transformations, the Journal of Inclusive Pedagogy and Scholarship, Feminist Africa, which is a South African-based journal, Asian Women, which is a Korean-based journal, and Feminist Economics, and the Caribbean Review of Gender Studies. Professor Talpade Mohanty is a steering committee member of the Municipal Services Project, a transnational research and advocacy group focused on alternatives to privatization in the global south, a founding member of the De uh, Democratizing um, Knowledge Collective at Syracuse University, and coordinating team member of the Future of Minority Studies Research Project. She's worked with three grassroots uh, community organizations, Grassroots Leadership in North Carolina, Center for immigration, uh, Immigrant Families in New York City, and Awareness in Orissa, India, and was a member of the Indigenous and Women of Color Solidarity Delegation to Palestine in June 2001. Mohanty has served as a consultant evaluator for the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the Ford Foundation, and UN Women. 
She's series editor of Comparative Feminist Studies for Palgrave Macmillan and the recipient of an honorary degree, uh, doctorate um, from the Faculty of Social Sciences at Lund University in Sweden, which was presented in 2008, and an honorary doctorate in Humanities from the College of Worcester, Ohio, which was awarded in 2012. As most of you all in this room know, but nonetheless I will uh, reinforce uh, or uh, some, uh, try make a very inadequate um, effort to summarize some of her work. It focuses on transnational feminist theory, anti-capitalist feminist praxis, anti-racist education and the politics of uh, knowledge. Central to Mohanty's transnational mission is the project of building what she calls a non-colonizing feminist solidarity across the borders through an intersectional analysis of race, nation, colonialism, sexuality, <laughs> class, and gender. In a 1984 essay under Western Eyes, Feminist Scholarship and Colonial Discourses, which we know by now is compulsory reading in every gender studies syllabus, thank God for small mercies, I quote her, the relationship between women, a cultural and ideological composite, other constructed through diverse representation, uh, composite other di constructed through diverse representational discourses, namely scientific, literary, juridical, linguistic, cinematic, etc., and women, real material subjects of their collective histories, is one of the central questions the practice of feminist scholarship seeks to address. In this essay, Mohanty critiques the political project of Western feminism and its discur uh, discursive construction of the category of the third world woman as a homogeneous entity. In Mohanty's view, Western feminisms have tended to gloss over the differences between Southern women and that the experience of oppression is incredibly diverse and contingent upon geography, history, and culture. Her intervention highlighted the difficulties faced by feminists from the third world in being heard within the broader feminist movement and led to a redefining of power relations between feminists within the first and third worlds. In 2003, Mohanty's book, Feminism Without Borders, Decolonizing Theory, Practi Practicing Solidarity, outlined the challenges of bridging theory and praxis and the, politic and the political and personal. Major themes addressed include the politics of difference, transnational solidarity building, anti-capitalist struggle against neoliberal globalization. In the final section, Reorienting Feminism, Mohanty offers a response to criticism of her essay under Western eyes, even as she reiterates her belief in the possibility and necessity of building common political projects between third world and Western feminisms. This remains a challenge given that the post-colonial and third world feminism, uh, feminist critique of global sisterhood and imperialist Western feminism is still relevant. Critical insights of post-colonial feminists and third world women's movement like intersectionality, diaspora, diversity, difference have become career-making machines for Western feminisms. Stuart Hall once stated that the problem with the British is not that they hate blacks, but that but the problem is that without them, they do not know who they are. One could argue that without third world women and migrant women, Western feminists would not know who they are. In her inspiring talk, Angela Davis addresses the question, how does change happen? I'd like to share with you one of my favorite jokes about the German academia, and it goes like this. <laughs> you know the joke. You know the joke. <laughs> OK, the joke is, how many German professors does it take to change a light bulb? A light bulb, glue burner. Oh my god, did you say change? Jokes like these got me into trouble in Frankfurt, but I... <laughs> but you know, I knew that when you tell the emperor he's naked, there will be consequences. Now, regardless of the hype about intersectionality and diversity as emancipatory con concepts, they regrettably remain predominantly symbolic commitments in academic and policy discourses and institutional practices. Despite claims to do diversity and to be diverse, discourses and institutions sustain the status quo 
through, for instance, Eurocentric and androcentric academic curricula and discriminatory hiring practices. The rhetoric of diversity is employed to deflect charges of racism and heterosexism. So, I mean, if colleagues are doing anti-racist politics and are dealing with post-colonial feminism, then they can't be racist. Western feminism, mostly bourgeois, heterosexual, white feminists are the ones who have gained the most from the intellectual labor of migrant, third world, post-colonial feminism. Of course, they can do it better than you and me. This makes it all the more imperative to explore the possibilities of transnational alliance building. Chandra Talpade Mohanty's academic and activist work in this field has inspired all of us and has been important for our intellectual formation, motivating us to struggle with these difficult questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chandra, Chandra Talpade Mohanty to Gyothe University, Frank. Thank you so much, Nikita. And thank you, Helma, and thank you, Kira, and thank you to everyone who worked so hard to make this visit possible for me. I'm completely delighted to be here, and I am going to uh, talk for about 50 minutes, and I, if I start boring you or if I start irritating you, irritating is okay. If I start <laughs> boring you, just, you know, um, signal to me and I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more animated in what I'm saying. Um, so I'm also really, really honored to be um, the Angela Davis guest professor. Um, Angela has actually checked in every day with me <laughs> since I got here. So, and I, I say every day, it's, this is my second day, mind you, uh, that I'm having fun. Don't worry, I'm having fun, and I am, actually. So, um, it's most appropriate, I think, that I focus today on wars, walls, and borders, and specifically on feminist post-colonial critique. There's some really simple uh, reasons that are current that I'm gonna just tell you, right? So the UN uh, Refugee Agency data suggests that 59 million people are displaced around the world. So that means one in 122 people are internally displaced or seeking asylum in another country. This is the highest level of displaced people ever recorded. And as we know, patterns of displacement and migration reveal unequal relations between rich and poor, north and south, and between whiteness and its racialized others. Two, when Angela was here, um, I think in Germany, I'm not sure in Frankfurt, uh, a few months ago, she declared that the refugee movement is the movement of the 21st century. And the refugee movement is all about wars, walls, and borders, as you know. And then finally, I'm just thinking about the you know, what is heralded and is a historic, maybe a historic climate agreement that's in fact happening, I think, this evening in Paris, right? And the fact that while it is incredible and historic, it actually does, does not include gender equality at all. There was a negotiation, I don't know, you all are looking puzzled. You must have heard this that there was a negotiation between countries where gender equality got dropped just as the politics of occupation got dropped. So there was a, so gender equality is nowhere in the climate agreement, which is a little bit astounding, given who would, is at the brunt of uh, climate change, who actually bears the brunt, all over the world that is. Okay, so given these urgencies, right, I really um, want to talk to you then about wars, walls, borders, anatomies of violence, and post-colonial feminist critique. 
My talk today offers a post-colonial anti-imperialist feminist critique that connects struggles for liberation across different geographies and develops a vision for transnational feminist praxis and solidarity work. I have always believed that feminism matters, a feminism that is anchored in decolonizing, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and transnational commitments keeps me alive and gives me hope. And so I'm gonna to begin today then with a very brief reflection on my personal political intellectual journey as a feminist and why I deeply believe in the creation of alliances and solidarities across gender, race, class, sexual, and national divides, and that these alliances really point the way forward. Growing up in Mumbai, India, as part of the post-independence generation, it was impossible not to be aware of colonial legacies, colonized spaces, both psychic and institutional, decolonizing movements and practices, global national liberation struggles, and the excitement generated by the vision of a democratic socialist, post-colonial, seemingly autonomous nation state. I have come to believe in the idea of generational mandates. For my post-independence generation, this mandate was to take the theoretical problematic of decolonization very seriously and to look for insurgent knowledges. This consciousness of, de of colonized spaces and their effects. So for example, a high school curriculum that taught me the history of the British Raj and almost nothing about my own local regional history or my community. So this consciousness of colonized spaces and their effects has stayed with me and is a touchstone for understanding how power works, what it hides, what it makes visible, what it makes natural and normative. Decolonization then could never merely be a formal process of the handing over of governance to local elite. It had to be a deeper insurgent process that involves transformation of self, community, and governance structures at all levels, an active withdrawal of consent, <clears throat> and corresponding resistance to practices of psychic and social domination. Decolonization had to be a collective process anchored in indigenous histories of struggle. I mean this very seriously because I often think people think that one could sit in a room and decolonize oneself. Okay, that is completely not possible. Or one can talk to one person. That is therapy. That is not decolonization. Decolonization, in fact, has to be a collective struggle. It has to be where you check what's going on with other people who are in the same situation as you are, okay? And whose reading of power may be slightly different, but who can help you think about this and struggle together. At this time then, as an undergraduate college student in India, and then a high school teacher in Lagos, Nigeria, and after that, a graduate student in the USA, in the late 1970s, I turned to the work of Fano, Memi, Cabral, Césaire, in addition to Luxembourg, Marx, Engels, and later Marcuse, Althusser, and Said for understanding colonized spaces and the practice of decolonization. My engagement in student movements against the fascist state of emergency imposed by Indira Gandhi in the early 70s and in left anti-capitalist movements in general brought home the centrality of class, caste, and religious fundamentalisms in the exercise of state power in India. My work in Nigeria exposed yet another fault line, that of race and color. But it wasn't until I got to Illinois in 1977 that I began to really understand the interwoven politics of race, color, class, and nation specifically in relation to gender and sexuality. It was at that time that I became a third world immigrant woman of color with roots in the global south. And I say that all those categories are really, really significant. My experience in the late 1970s and the early 80s then was that of a third world immigrant woman of color living in the USA. Since 1998, I'm a US citizen the identification that feels the most fragile and the one with the most weight 
and accountability in a post 9-11 world. Almost four decades of living in the US as a political thinker and activist has meant having come to, term to, having to, come to terms with the shifting meanings of citizenship, identity, and descent. Clearly, the meanings attached to being a feminist and being a US citizen are multiple, anchored in effective affiliations in India and the US, linked to the post-colonial history of India, friendship and solidarity networks in both spaces, as well as in the diaspora, and post 9-11, entangled in the slippage between South Asian, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and Arab identities in the US. My primary connections and communities in the US are with people of all races and ethnicities, especially third world people who share my politics and vision for justice. <clears throat> I learned very early in my intellectual journey that the best thinking and strategizing emerges through collaborations with diverse communities of people with similar commitments and vision of justice. And I have worked to build these radical intellectual neighborhoods in the service of social justice. So that was my little spiel. Okay. I began thinking about securitized regimes and anatomies of violence after hearing about the building of a US mega security wall along the South Texas-Mexico border and the struggles of immigrant activists and the Lipin Apache Women's Defense Organization, LAW Defense is what they call themselves, to halt this explicitly imperialist partition project. What seemed obvious was the use of unjust militarized trade practices, similar to those used in the war zones of Iraq and Afghanistan, using the pretext of the war on terror to mobilize simultaneous discourses of Islamophobia and nativism. They were conjoined, conjoined at that time. And yet, the struggles of this organization, that is law defense, and even the building of the mega security wall in East Texas were almost completely absent from public discussion in the media and in left feminist circles. While US imperial projects are not new, the post 9-11 global formation and operation of securitized states anchored within the rhetoric of protectionism and the war on terror and accompanied by militarized neoliberal corporate ambitions is a phenomenon that deserves critical feminist attention. So today I'm going to examine very briefly three securitized regimes, the USA, Israel, and India, and three specific geopolitical sites, the US-Mexico border and the struggles around immigration and cross-border indigenous rights in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, that's the first site, Israel's rule over the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza, that's my second site, <clears throat> and India's military rule and occupation of the Kashmir Valley, that is Jammu and Kashmir, as zones, that's my third site, as zones of normalized violence. At these sites, neoliberal and militarized state and imperial practices are often sustained by development, peacekeeping, humanitarian projects, thus illuminating the new contours of securitized states that function as imperial democracies. I put those two together very deliberately, imperial and democracies. And we are living at a, at a point where there are imperial democracies, states that would, um, call, would, would never call themselves that, but can be seen as that. Each site encodes genealogies, memories, and traumas of colonial occupation, partition, and violence in the building of the nation. What novelist Babsi Sidwa calls the demand for blood when the earth is divided. And in each of these geopolitical sites at the territorial borders of the nation, civilians are subjected to militarized violence anchored in the production of reactionary gender identities and dominant and subordinate, often racialized masculinities. These three sites constitute occupied dis disputed territories with violent colonial histories, and together they illustrate a new 
old global order of militarized violence and engendered by neoliberal economic priorities. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Since the early 1990s, with India's shift to neoliberal economic and governance policies, the ties between the US, Israel, and India have been forged through the vision of the regimes in power at that time, since the 1990s, right? So you have Bush and the neoconservatives, you have Sharon and Likud, and you have the BJP and the Hindu right at that time in power. As Rupal Oza suggests, since the early 1990s, the geopolitical triad of the US, Israel, and India share a vision of threat and security based on ongoing economic and military alliances. The same anti-Muslim rhetoric is evident in the current refugee crisis in Europe, where we have the Hungarian prime minister saying Muslims must be blocked to keep Europe Christian. Europe and European identity is rooted in Christianity. This is according to Viktor Orban. We have neo-Nazi attacks on asylum seekers in Germany, as you know, and remember that the majority of refugees are from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan and are Muslim. And then we have the growth of detention centers or reception centers or camps in Hungary and Turkey. However, while the us versus them ideologies of securitized states justify borders, walls, and regimes of incarceration in the name of protection of the homeland, it is the connectivity and commonality of analysis and vision of justice between people across borders that feminists and anti-partition activists have in common that inspires my reflections. So the reason I'm doing this work is not to tell you um, that the world is in serious trouble. We know this. The reason I'm doing the work is because I actually um, have evidence and know people who work across these borders to both share a way of thinking and a way of organizing and pushing back against this, which is um, both hopeful and uh, the only way to think about going forward. A comparative analysis of the wars, walls, and, and walls that constitute the securitized regimes and colonial imperial ventures of the US, India, and is Israel reveals the ideological operation of discourse, discourses of democracy within the overly militarized, securitized nation states of India, Israel, and the US, and suggests that the militarization of cultures is deeply linked to neoliberal capitalist values and the normalization of what uh, Zila Eisenstein and Arundhati Roy have both called imperial democracy. Needless to say, militarization always involves masculinization and heterosexualization as linked state projects. <clears throat> and neoliberal economic arrangements are predicated on gendered and racialized divisions of labor and construction of subjectivities <clears throat> and construction of subjectivities, thus necessitating feminist critique. National security states or securitized regimes typically use connected strategies of militarization, criminalization, and, in, and incarceration to exercise control over particular populations, thus remaking individual subjectivities and public cultures. <clears throat> so for instance, one of the most important things politically that has happened in the US, um, and that's in the public domain after um, Ferguson and the Black Lives Matter movement are these connections. In fact, people can see these connections and we no longer have to um, pretend. Um, so for instance, um, when you have Donald Trump saying we should keep Muslims out of the border, you have um, um, indigenous groups that jokingly respond, yes, we should also close off the border to all Christians. I mean, think about the history of the US and what that means, right? It makes complete sense. Um, okay. Thus, for instance, in terms of the European refugee crisis, Greece built a, bar built a barbed wire fence along the Greece-Turkey border in 2013, 
Hungarian prison inmates worked on preparing materials for 900 military personnel to begin construction of the 109-mile-long razor wire fence along the border with Serbia in order to protect Europe from migrants. <clears throat> and they are ready to build a fence along the border now with Romania. And Austria, Slovakia, and the Netherlands all introduced checkpoints and border controls to manage the refugee crisis. And you all can, can do the math in terms of Germany as well. As feminist philosopher Iris Young argues, national secu security states mobilize a particular gendered logic of masculinist protection in relation to women and children. A logic that underwrites the appeal to protection and security of the nation, right? And expects obedience and loyalty at home, which is then seen as patriotism, right? And so patriotism is not about dissent ever, okay? When you disagree with the nation, that is seen in the US anyway, very often you're accused of being anti-American, okay? So the only way you can be a patriot is to be completely um, in agreement with the policies of the nation, right? At the same time, the state wages war against internal and external enemies, right? In the context of the US, it is this logic that Iris Young claims legitimates authoritarian power in the domestic arena and justifies aggression outside its borders, right? So the two are linked. So the targeting and criminalizing of particular populations within the state and the imperialist venture that ventures and occupations that target particular people outside. So these militarized state projects in these three sites sustain endless wars and border zones of violence while normalizing incarceration regimes within their respective domestic landscapes. The U.S. invests in a fast-growing privatized prison industrial complex within its own borders while consolidating post-invasion regimes of torture and collective punishment in Iraq and Afghanistan. This happened parallel. Similar questions need to be posed in relation to the democracies of Israel and India. After 9-11-2001, in all three geopolitical contexts, the state mobilizes a masculinist, securitized ideology based not on just the defense of the nation, but on coercion that requires neither participation nor consent from its citizens. This gendered ideology is anchored in militarized masculinities, or as someone has talked about it, muscular militarism, and in patriarchal ideologies of protection and security that require obedience and consent from its citizens. <clears throat> In the Texas-Mexico borderlands, the West Bank and Gaza, and Kashmir Valley, dispossession of particular subjects, women, poor, indigenous, migrant, Muslim, etc., involves the social control and legal dispossession, or as Avery Gordon has called it, social death, through justified forms of surveillance and violence at multiple levels. The political economy of securitized states is focused fundamentally on the permanent abandonment of certain captive populations that are marked as threats to the neoliberal order. So here, militarized capitalism enshrined within securitized states works in concert with fundamentalist Hindu, Muslim, Zionist, and Christian social movements to produce a surge of, neo, of reactionary neoliberal gender identities. Speaking of Argentina in the 20th century, Rita Arditi refers to the exercise of state violence within a culture of impunity. A culture of impunity occurs when the state operates without fear of punishment. And impunity is normalized as routine procedure across political and legal domains producing a kind of disordered order or state of exception, which is necessary then for the process of domination. This is a form of governmentality where the state regimes of surveillance, criminalization, and the legal suspension of rights in the name of protecting the nation from so-called insurgents and illegals operates with impunity, disappearing citizens, imprisoning others, and denying basic civil and economic rights to particular marginalized communities. 
In 2015, migrant detainees form one of the fastest growing prison populations around the Western world. Three countries, including the US and Israel, have built 3,500 miles of walls on their borders, and 40,000 deaths since 2000 are linked to migration. So here's a very brief snapshot of the three securitized regimes that I'm talking about. So first, the US. <clears throat> In 2010, the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, this is in the United States, released a report entitled Injustice for All, the Rise of the U.S. Immigration Policing Regime. Drawing on testimonials and reports from the Human Rights Community Action Network, members in 11 states, uh, from, from the network in 11 states, the report poignantly demonstrates the impact of a U.S. policing regime that uses immigrant status to segregate people, profiling people of color in new ways during a severe economic downturn. The report claims that, quote, public officials and corporations collaborate to cut and or privatize public services, using, including using for-profit private prisons to incarcerate people for immigration charges, destroying civil and labor rights. Immigration status is also being used to deny indigenous people their right to identity, land, and community." End of quote. In 2003, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security launched what it called Operation Endgame, which is a decade-long plan to, quote, remove all removable aliens. Please pay attention to this language. I completely love it because it hides nothing. It says exactly what it wants to say, right? Um, it was at this time that the Immigration and Naturalization Service in the US was subsumed under the Department of Homeland Security, thus explicitly linking questions of national security to, quest to issues of migration and immigration. Okay? Both those agencies were joined together and therefore linking those issues. The Human Rights Community Action Network estimates that there were about 11.1 million undocumented immigrants living in the U.S. in 2010. Through Operation Endgame, the DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security, built a new immigration policing regime that connects issues of, quote, immigration, citizenship, the war on terror, border control, national security, crime, law enforcement, and the economy, all under the guise of protecting the homeland. Okay, I'm gonna do that again because that's quite a list and it's actually a significant list when you put all those together, right? So immigration, citizenship, the war on terror, border control, national security, crime, law enforcement, and the economy. They all are conjoined under the legal rules and regulations that are produced at that time. The report makes a powerful statement about the operation of the US as a neoliberal securitized imperial state, using the policing and incarceration of immigrants, escalating militarization of immigrant and border communities, and scapegoating immigrants for the economic crisis, always rhetorically linking immigration to national security. Okay, immigration to national security. <clears throat> So for instance, the passage in April 2010 of a law called SB 1070, which is Arizona's racial profiling and anti-immigrant law, required the police to verify the status of persons subjected of being undocumented, suspected of being undocumented. This law actually led to some completely ridiculous things, like people could be stopped while driving cars only because some policemen thought they looked undocumented. Um, So anyone arrested in Arizona under 1070 could not be released until police, cannot be released until police verify their citizenship status with the Department of Homeland Security and the Immigration and Controls Enforcement. Once again, linking national security to immigrant status. Immigrants are now increasingly women. 
And rounding up and detaining women has very specific impact on their families. And then this too is a profoundly gendered process. January 2012 figures indicate that the migrant death rate on the Arizona border more than doubled between 2009 and 2011, while the Department of Homeland Security continued to expand its criminalization policies. In 2014, Border Patrol agents arrested more than 68,000 migrants traveling as families along the Mexico border. Um, ICE program, that is the Immigration Control Enforcement Pilot Program, called RGV-250, uses GPS-enabled ankle bracelets to track heads of families that cross the border illegally, and that's been introduced to cut down the cost of privatized immigrant detention centers along the border. So now, now we're talking about virtual detention, right, where GPS ankle bracelets can track movements of people. Since 1998, more than 6,000 migrants have, di have died crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, and early this year, in 2015, 50,000 children from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador were appre apprehended crossing the border. Okay, my other, second site. Democracy and security in Israel and Palestine. In an incisive analysis of gendered violence in occupied Gaza, Hagar Kotev argues that the framework of democracy in Israel is now the framework of security, a radically inequitable frame where the security of some groups means the insecurity of others, where Israel's security constitutes so-called democracy for Palestinians. The state of Israel bases its democracy entirely on an ethnic demographic notion of citizenship with the right of return for Jews only. Israel is a capitalist, class-divided, securitized state that excludes non-Jews and Arabs from citizenship. Non-citizens have very few rights and no claim on the Israeli state. Since 1948, the partition of the Palestinian territory has meant the establishment of the State of Israel and the simultaneous <clears throat> uprooting and mass dispersal of Palestinians from their homeland. Thus, while 1948 represents the building of a homeland for Israel, it represents al-Nakba, the catastrophe for Palestinians. Defeat, displacement, trauma, dispossession, and the beginning of a liberation movement. Kotev suggests that the contemporary discourse of terror collapses the distinction between civilians and soldiers in national security states, and that humanitarian actions thus become accessories to state violence against Palestinians. She argues that humanitarianism provides, alongside terror, the logic of security. It is, in fact, Israel's closing off of the Gaza Strip that has led to a humanitarian crisis of vast proportions. And it is in the name of humanitarian missions that Israel controls access to Gaza. What is a separation fence to Israelis in the West Bank is, after all, an apartheid wall to Palestinians. What is a mega security wall for elite landowners in Texas is, in fact, containment and imprisonment for the indigenous nations that cross the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Okay, now my third site very briefly. The Kashmir Valley, that is Jammu and Kashmir, is one of the most highly militarized zones in the world. The Indian government has deployed over 600,000 border security and over a quarter of a million paramilitary forces in the valley, which has a population of 13 million. This is one of the highest soldier-to-civilian population ratios anywhere in the world. And I don't know how many people know this. How many people know this? Great. Three people. Um, while much has been written about the history of Indian occupation of Kashmir and about the way the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan creates and recreates this trauma in Jammu and Kashmir, I'm most interested here in the functioning of the Indian militarized state apparatus in the Kashmir Valley 
and the way in which it controls and defines identity, community, and subjectivity. The object of three wars, an arms race, and a nuclear race between India and Pakistan, Kashmir has been disputed territory since 1947. It has witnessed the increasingly political role of the military and of Islamist movements in Pakistan, as well as the rise of Hindu fundamentalism in India. The Kashmir Valley has been treated by India as a state of emergency since 1947. This is the longest running continuous war, by the way, in the world, over 50 years. Since the 1960s, there has been a growing movement against Indian occupation, leading to escalating tensions in the 1980s with the formation of the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, an underground secessionist movement engaged in an armed struggle for self-determination. The nature of the rebellion in the early 1990s changed with the emergence of over 100 separatist organizations, some with explicitly religious and pro-Pakistani politics. In response, India passed the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in 1990, basically granting the military state, the military state impunity to enforce a regime of surveillance and incarceration in Kashmir. I want you to pay attention to how these laws get passed at a particular moment in the early 90s, and they get passed in lots of countries around the world, right? Um, the AFSPA, which is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, underwrote the ideological framing of the Kashmir Valley in terms of fear and threat mobilizing the rhetoric of insurgency and counterinsurgency and justifying the suspension of constitutional rights and freedoms. This act in the Kashmir Valley allows the legal suspension of the distinction between legality and illegality. So state agents are thus allowed to act with impunity and they're protected by the, AF, the AFSPA. Custodial killings, torture, detention without trial or charge, rape, the use of human shields is protected by this act. Here as well, we see the creation of what some activists in the Rio Grande Valley have called a constitution-free zone. Think of what that means, right? A constitution-free zone where the constitution does not operate and where, where people in power do not feel obliged to be accountable to the Constitution. And this is a, a zone which is similar to the Texas-Mexico border and the West Bank and Gaza. So to summarize, in spite of different histories of colonialism and imperialism, there is a remarkable similarity in the forms of governmentality that is exercised by the securitized states of India, Israel, and the US, and now I think the EU as well in relation to the, ref quote, migrant refugee crisis. Recall that the EU response to the migrant refugee crisis is framed, it's framed in humanitarian and religious terms, not in terms of justice or democracy or equality of all human beings. And that similar securitized regimes, militarizations and forms of governmentality are being enacted at broader crossings in Europe. So the historical responsibility and role of European governments, that is, the histories of colonialism and racism and exploitation of Europe, right, in causing, precipitating, and helping to find solutions to these conflicts is largely absent. I'm not reading any of this, actually. However, I believe that these forms of governmentality are most visible in the normalization of state violence in the borderlands of Texas, Mexico, Kashmir, and West Bank, Gaza. I don't mean that they don't exist elsewhere. I'm saying they're more visible in these spaces. And I, I chose those spaces because I had particular connections to each space, not for any other reason, okay? And because there is a whole history of collaboration, of militarization between these three countries. Comparing these geopolitical sites allows us to understand the way the war on terror and militarized cultures, state violence, and the transformation of civilians into insurgents and illegals through the legal suspension of civil rights is symptomatic of imperial democracies at this time. 
in each context, the sovereignty of the state is predicated on the operation of constitution-free zones at the borders of the nation. The normalized violence against particular bodies, Muslim, female, immigrant, native, Arab, buttresses the discourses of protectionism and citizenship in each country. In each case, we can identify states of exception whereby the suspension of law is required for the practice of empire. In each context, citizenship remains elusive for the inhabitants of these borderlands. And identity is always in question given the existence of checkpoints and I-cards. In these securitized landscapes, identity documents become a form of governance and a part of the state apparatus of surveillance. The process of verifying identity produces what Tobias Kelly calls, quote, documented lives. That is, particular forms of sub subjectivity that are marked by anxiety, uncertainty, and fear. Okay, that that is what one's psychic life becomes. Kelly's work focuses on Palestinians, but a similar argument can be made in the other contexts as well, I think, for this idea of documented lives. A biomilitarized body project is evident in each site, and women are impacted in different, although similar ways, since, since violence is a part of daily life, as is the presence of paramilitary and police forces. In the Kashmir Valley, women are victims of sexual violence, of domestic abuse and rape, and live with increasing trauma, stress, depression, miscarriages, spontaneous abortions, etc. There are increasing number of widows and so-called half-widows, which is a very strange um, label, but it's basically women whose husbands have disappeared and they don't have evidence of their passing. In 1947, women's militias were an integral part of the Quit Kashmir movement, while many women in recent years have organized under the banner of the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons and under the Kashmiri Women's Initiative for Peace and Disarmament. The impact of Israeli occupation on Palestinian women is profound as well. The erasure of the difference between home and battlefield, or between home and battlefield, between, and between civilians and soldiers means that neighborhoods and homes become the battlefield in Gaza and now, as we heard recently, in East Jerusalem as well. <clears throat> the occupation sinks public space, confining women to the household, while long-term unemployment for men in Gaza, for instance, was at 40% before the Israeli invasion in June 2014. Such instabilities translate into changed family dynamics and often a rise in domestic violence in the home. When the very identities of people come under question, when sexual, ethnic, and political violence becomes normative, as it does in these landscapes, the structure of imperial democracies is laid bare. In fact, the governance practices of securitized regimes is such that security is deeply entangled with citizenship or subject subjectivation processes, how one becomes a subject. While democratic state projects focus on producing national citizens, in securitized regimes, what is at stake is the opposite, the undoing of the very possibility of citizenship for targeted populations like indigenous and Mexican peasant workers, migrant workers, Palestinians in the occupied territories, and civilians in the Kashmir Valley. These borderlands constitute shadow communities at the social and territorial margins of the state places that exist as part of the formal state, but excluded from it so that the violent realities of everyday life and the legal and extra-legal networks that support them are caught up in layers of invisibility. Thus, this logic of violence, containment, and expulsion produces patterns of social abandonment and death with consequences for both communities targeted as enemies and outsiders, and also for the entire political body of rights-bearing citizens, because it draws them and us into the field of state violence. 
these forms of truncated subjectivity and non-citizenship are a profound marker of global security landscapes at this time. Okay. Doing okay, Nikita? No. Time-wise? Okay. No. Okay. Um, so I have a quote by uh, um, uh, Arab-American feminist uh, poet and organizer Nadine Saliba, who in 2006 said, quote, the first colonization of the Americas by Europe dismembered the land and put in motion a process that wiped out indigenous peoples and their civilizations. Zionist colonization of Palestine has also dismembered the land and attempted to eradicate the indigenous people's cultural identity and destroy any sign of their previous presence in the land. It wiped over 400 Palestinian villages and dispossessed their residents, turning them into stateless refugees in the lands of exile and outsiders, in the lands of exile and outsiders and strangers in their own land. The Southwest, that is the American Southwest, was subjected to another wave of colonization by American settlers. This act of imperialism divided the Mexican people between two sides of an artificial border, end of quote. This quote illustrates the historical and contemporary connectivities forged by feminist and anti-partition activists at the Esperanza Center in San Antonio, Texas. The US Secure Fence Act of 2006 gave the Department of Homeland Security unilateral power to waive 36 federal laws at the Texas-Mexico international border and in collaboration with NAFTA partners, begin building a Berlin-style concrete mega security wall. This waiver of laws led to the militarization of the entire region of the lower Rio Grande, voiding legal rights and protections of indigenous peoples to culture, environment, biodiversity, and sacred sites. A clear example of US imperial policy seen as rational, right, through the frame of the war on terror and an incarceration regime that targets immigrants. In this case, laws and their suspension are used as weapons to destabilize, fragment, assimilate, and disappear communities that are historically residing along the Rio Grande. The organization I mentioned before, Law Defense, which was founded by a mother-daughter team, Eluisa Garcia Tamez and Margot Tamez in 2007, focuses on community organization and documentation and research and education, thus strengthening indigenous people's struggles against, the U against US colonial violence, as well as in relation to legal struggles in tribal US and international law courts. Capitalist profit-making and corporate agendas instigated by the US, NAFTA partners, and corporations with mining interests operate in full force here as waivers work differently for rich landowners and industrialists and for poor indigenous and Mexican border communities. So laws do not get applied equally. Rich landowners have waivers from the building of the wall while indigenous communities have walls built on their land. And so this is what the activists have called a constitution-free zone. Thus, indigenous peoples and illegal, quote, illegal immigrants that are poor Mexican peasants usually, are constructed in similar ways, criminalized and defined, okay, and these are the terms, as drug lords, terrorists, labor migrants, and civic re resistors. These are all the terms that get used in the, um, um, in the way the policing works. So it's therefore imperative to disaggregate both categories, immigrant and indigenous, okay? They're not two separate categories. You have to disaggregate both because at this historical juncture, both are produced by a securitized state engaged in the war on terror. The continued reinvention of the immigrant and the indigenous and the way in which immigration law 
especially laws against the illegal immigrant, have profound impact in indigenous communities is new. This is something new that has happened, right? The Odam and Lipan Apache territory crosses the US-Mexico border. So now we're talking about indigenous nations that are not neatly contained within the border of the US or within the border of Mexico. Their territory actually crosses both. Mexico now requires US passports for the indigenous people, the ODAM, who travel beyond 12 miles into Mexican territory. Tribal passports and apparent, are apparently respected but often questioned when the ODAM return to US territory. Arizona law 1070 justifies the presence of border patrol on reservation lands. Checkpoints have been established throughout this territory, thus controlling the free movement of the Akimel and Tohono O'Dam peoples, especially elders who do not have birth certificates but need to travel across the US-Mexico border to Malina and Magdalena, Magdalena in Mexico for religious pilgrimage. Reports by um, the US national public radio stations and community organizations like Grassroots Leadership, which I have worked with for many decades, have revealed that SB 1070, which is Arizona's law against uh, race, race, race and ethnic studies, and the law against the illegal, the policing of uh, what whoever thought was undocumented, was funded for by the for-profit prison complex. And this was, you may have read this in the newspapers, but, but basically it was the corporations who um, uh, are the for-profit prison uh, corporations funded the law itself, the law itself. So while SB 1070 talks specifically about enforcement and this is another term which is fabulous, enforcement through attrition of illegal immigrants, it has morphed into the policing of indigenous lands and communities. The checkpoints on the reservation resemble checkpoints in Palestinian territories. People who live on the Tohono O'Dam reservation have their everyday lives profoundly shaped by the surveillance and militarization enforced by SB 1070. Thus, militarization is fundamental to the construction of community and identity. The combination of checkpoints, identity verification, and surveillance suggests a specific form of the production of documented subjectivities. Since 2013, there have been two important mega projects underway across the Texas-Mexico border. One, a large rail transport system that will traverse over the border wall in the lower Rio Grande Valley, and two, the building of a trans-Texas corridor that con connects Alberta, Canada, to South Texas, to Mexico, that is part of a trans-hemispheric, quote, security prosperity partnership. I love that. Security prosperity partnership, unquote, that entails, quote, priority matters of national security, unquote, being transported by a mega heavy rail freight bridge over the Lipan Apache territory, okay? So as Nadine Saliba, who I quoted earlier, suggests, there are clear confluences between the impact of US colonial and imperial projects and Israel's colonization and occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. The organizing work of the Esperanza Center brings these connections home in terms of the impact of walls, borders, and dispossession in the lives of women in Palestine and the borderlands of South Texas, and offers a moving and illuminating look at the amazing cross-border transnational feminist organizing and community building that has occurred over the last <clears throat> five years, five or more years. While the profiters and state managers in each of these sites share resources and technologies of surveillance and violence, it is the people in the impacted communities who share forms of surveillance and resistance to the normalized violence of the securitized regimes in US and Israel. <clears throat> In both contexts, social movements focus on environmental justice and land struggles. 
The militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border and the building of the mega security wall destroys agriculture and livelihoods for peasants and indigenous communities on both sides of the border. The apartheid wall and the endless war in the occupied Palestinian territory has destroyed homes and uprooted olive trees and orchards, a symbol of livelihood and home for Palestinians. These are shared colonial moment, histories of violence and dispossession, and they can be mobilized to create connectivities and resistance to partitions and walls in Palestine and in South Texas. And that's what the center actually has been doing for many years. What is hopeful here is the way communities organize in resistance. In the US-Mexico borderlands, there are new political formations and alliances between organizations of day laborers, migrant workers, radical high school and university students, queer and transgender Mexican migrants, indigenous presence and migrants, native anarchists, anti-racist white organizations, neighborhood groups or barrio defense groups, anti-privatization organizations, prison abolitionist organizations, edu activists, and mainstream alliance organizations like the Mexican consulate, legislatures, and unions. And all of these work in solidarity. If you think about the range of groups I've talked about, they don't necessarily share a politics, okay? But they do in relation to this project. This coalition is constituted as it is because activists have conjoined a number of Arizona laws that have decimated ethnic studies <clears throat> and, oh, sorry, that have decimated ethnic studies um, and hmm, a number of Arizona laws that have decimated ethnic studies. For instance, HB 2281, which was passed in May 2010, bans Arizona schools from teaching ethnic studies, right? Cast aside affirmative action, there was a Prop 187 anti-affirmative action legislation, and now SB 1070. So we're talking about these different laws, right? All of these laws may look like they target, target separate communities in separate places, right? But which is precisely how hegemonic power wants to have it function. But clearly, political organizing has done the work of connecting the links and of showing the connectivity within different kinds of violence to which communities are being subjected. So similar cross-border and cross-community coalitions are evident in the Israeli and Palestinian feminist struggles against Israeli occupation, and Indian, Pakistani, and Kashmiri women organizing against all forms of state and communal violence across borders, religions, and national loyalties. The insurgent knowledges generated by these forms of activism engender the new political subjectivities and visions of citizenship necessary to confront imperial democracies. I've argued that post 9-11 consolidation of imperial democracies and securitized regimes in the US, Israel, and India mobilize anatomies of violence anchored in colonial legacies and capitalist profit making. These regimes utilize specific and connected racial and gendered ideologies and practices. More specifically, I suggest that it is at the social and territorial borders of the nation in the US-Mexico borderlands, the West Bank and Gaza, and the Kashmir Valley, that securitized regimes exercise militarized and masculinized forms of control and of surveillance and dispossession that illuminate the contours of national political subjectivities and the uneven construction and dissolution of citizenship. <laughs> While anatomies of, borderlands in, of violence in these borderlands are more overt, Imperial democracies militarize all domains of social life and discipline and imprison not just abandoned and criminalized communities, but all state subjects. I believe similar arguments need to be made in relation to the EU and the current refugee crisis, given the, sim the similarity in the mobilization of militarized border controls, the visible Islamophobia, and the racial and gender ideologies and practices that underlie the treatment of women and children at the borders of European countries. 
The European Women's Lobby report claims, uh, claims an alarming increase in violence against women in transit zones, for instance, which is to be expected. Clearly, questions of citizenship and belonging and the invisibilizing of European colonial histories remain at the heart of this crisis. In fact, given the growing attack on children and using children to punish and control women and men at the border, at the border crossings in Europe, at the US-Mexico border, and in Palestine, not to mention that this is happening in the US over and over again as well. Um, for instance, there was this incident just, I think, a month ago of a Muslim boy in seventh grade who was handcuffed uh, because he had made a radio. And it was a radio for a science project. And he was, before asking any questions, he was handcuffed. The latest incident is that of a um, sixth grade uh, girl in, in a school in the Bronx who was attacked by three of her classmates in the playground. Um, they punched her, tried to pull off her hijab, and called her ISIS. I mean, this is just, it, it, it's becoming normalized, and it's completely scary. <clears throat> so given use, so, so uh, the growing attack on children and using children to punish and control women and men at the border crossings in Europe, at the U.S.-Mexico border and in Palestine, suggests that perhaps children are the new war booty, the new line of attack for these imperial democracies. In conclusion, I want to suggest there's much work to be done in confronting neoliberal securitized regimes masquerading as democracies. An alternate vision of connectivity and solidarity requires building ethical cross-border feminist solidarities that confront neoliberal militarization globally. This framing points towards strategies of resistance that can fundamentally transform economic and social inequalities from the ground up, leading to the creation of new political landscapes and visions of solidarity. Of course, this has already been demonstrated in the case of, for instance, Gaza and Ferguson, where Palestinian activists shared survival strategies with demonstrators in Ferguson, Missouri, in the US. And it is the experiences of marginalized communities, especially women, who so often sustain the networks of daily life that must inform processes of creating radical cross-border visions for economic and gender justice. Another example um, from last year is the Revitalize, Not Militarize campaign that sets up what they call border reality checkpoints along the Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Mexico border. In contrast to an interior border checkpoint, border res re residents who pass through a border reality checkpoint are empowered with information about their rights given the opportunity to join with efforts to bring about long-term changes to the agency, that's Customs and Border Patrol, and to announce, to denounce abuses they may have encountered by border agents. Participants in these actions set up their checkpoints near the border checkpoints, near ports of entry, or within border communities with high pedestrian traffic. This too, then, is a recent example of solidarities across immigrant and indigenous communities and organizations. Another world is always possible, especially as people begin to build the cross-border solidarities that allow us to see and create another way. So I'm going to end with my favorite quote um, from Arundhati Roy from many, many years ago in 2002. So here's Arundhati. Our strategy should be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen to shame it, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we are being brainwashed to believe. The corporate revolution will collapse if we refuse to buy what they are selling, their ideas, their version of history, their wars, their weapons, their notion of inevitability. Remember this, we be many and they be few. They need us more than we need them. Another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, 
I can hear her breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra, uh, for this very rich and uh, uh, very thought-provoking talk. Um, before I invite the um, members in the audience to pose their questions, I have a couple of questions, just a couple of clarifications. Also, um, in light of your previous um, publications and also your more recent publication, okay. you started your talk with uh, um, the, the assertion, I mean, extremely inspiring assertion of decolonization as a collective project. And then towards the end, uh, you also talked, and then you showed also how colonialism and neocolonialism was a project that was spread um, across, um, uh, I mean, geopolitical. It was, exactly, it had geopolitical, um, 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 it was spread um, across the uh, world, and you, you showed all connections and continuities between these different projects. Um, I'd like to come back to the question of, and of course, this very, very inspiring example from Arizona of alliances between very different uh, groups so with different interests. And I'd like to come back to this extremely important concept that you uh, suggested, but which has been a uh, cause of uh, lots of discussions. We had a discussion today in the afternoon about it. What does Mohanty mean by it? Um, do we agree or disagree with Mohanty on this? And that is the concept of common differences. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, you, your, your, your argument or your assertion is that common difference is one possibility of building alliances. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask you, uh, how do the conflicts function together with these common differences. You gave the example of the World Social Forum. You also used the slogan, another world is possible. Mm -hmm. And we know after a decade of World Social Forum, we've seen that there were also conflict of interest. Initially, mm -hmm. there was this euphoria and this enthusiasm that, you know, whether it's landless peasants and sex workers, sure. whether it's uh, um, peace activists or queer activists, that they can come together and it's an open space for utopias. And then um, as uh, after meeting after meeting, one saw that there were also conflicts of interest. Sure. So how do we account for conflict of interest when we are talking about decolonization as a collective project? And what do we do with these conflict of interest when we are invested in, um, uh, as you quoted Arundhati Roy, depriving empire of oxygen? Of oxygen. Okay. I have three questions, so I'll, I'll uh, take these three questions and then I'll open the floor to you. Okay. Um, I guess my first response would be that um, there is no way that any struggle we are involved in will not involve um, differences, uh, disagreements, and conflicts. Um, if that is the case, because different people's different interests are at stake in this, right? Um, if that's the case, um, one answer to it would be, okay, figure out if there is a vision of transformation or justice that can get a buy-in from different sets of people. So the Esperanza Center, that's what they did. What they did is do, and this is why I think I'm an academic, okay, because I actually think there is incredible work that has to do with uh, excavating knowledges, histories, and connectivities that can be done by those of us who are actually trained to do some of this work. We just have to be asking the questions that have to do with a larger socio-political transformative project and not just um, questions that have to do with uh, narrowly identity-based transformations. 
I think, right? So um, I think that common differences is um, one way of thinking about um, the work that marginalized constituencies have to do. That was where it came from. So the term common differences comes from the book that was written in 1981 by Gloria Joseph and Jill Lewis. And the book was called Common Differences, Conflicts in Black and White Feminist Perspectives. Okay, so that really is where it comes from. Um, subsequently, in fact, when I was a graduate student, um, before Under Westernized, um, sometimes I think my life is divided in that, <laughs> in that very odd way. Anyway, um, so um, I was a part of the organizing when I was a graduate student of this huge conference called Common Differences, uh, Third World Women and Feminist Perspectives at the University of Illinois in um, 1983. It was the first time, I think, that uh, there, was a, there were conversations between women from the Global South um, and women of color from the United States who had begun writing about some of the same issues of colonialism, racism, sexism, heter um, homophobia, etc. So, and that was, it was an incredible umbrella, I think, that term and that concept was an incredible umbrella to in fact bring these numerous sets of women to the conference, right? Um, now, were, did we have conflicts? We had huge conflicts, like huge conflicts. We had people arguing about um, economic dispossession being, and remember this is the early 80s, right? economic dispossession being more important than sexual liberation. Um, we, we had a huge argument between a very prominent black feminist and Shirley Moraga about that. Like, I still remember what it felt like to be in that room, right? So priority, priority of struggles, different interests, lack of understanding of other, somebody else's positioning and their sort of epistemological and experiential sort of location, et cetera. So yes, so those are inevitable. I think they're inevitable, and I think that it led to certain kinds of collaborations and alliances, be they small, right, um, that in fact many of us took forward after that. So I guess part of the response is that it's inevitable, and part of the response is you work at different scales. Mm -hmm. One works at very different scales. So on the one hand, while I can't offer, otherwise I would be king of the world, you know, if I if I'm able to offer like how how one can come under an umbrella and transform all of the different things. So I can't do that. But are there movements that are working in all kinds of corners of the globe? that actually do some of the work at different scales on the ground that most of the time we don't have access to. And that's part of the critique of the institutionalization of knowledge and the politics of knowledge, right? Because in fact, one doesn't have access to these kinds of insurgent knowledges and histories that one needs to, in order to see that there are these connections that are possible and that one can think through the common differences. I'm happy you brought out this question of conflict between economic dispossession and sexual oh. emancipation. Mm -hmm. And again, this was something that came up in our reading session today, whether Mohanty is very close to Fraser. I mean, Fraser was here last, uh, some months ago, last year, I think, where she presented her book, Fortunes of Feminism, where she again, you know, kind of lamented the fact that um, uh, 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 non-materialist struggles dovetail with neoliberalism, and that somehow there is a certain side like marginalization of materialist struggles by politics of recognition. Mm -hmm. So would you agree with that kind of diagnosis that your position kind of is close to Fraser's or Fraser's position is close to yours? Or you would say there are differences? Completely and then I have different. only one, one little more question and then... <laughs> okay, completely different. Okay. Yeah, I completely disagree with Fraser. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that uh, her writing, her writing of feminist history is completely flawed. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. So I think that to collapse, to collapse um, uh, forms of identity struggle, all forms of identity struggles, all forms of, um, you know, um, I don't know, anti-racist, um, sexual, transgender liberation struggles into a politics of identity which is generalized is a problem, one. Two, I think that uh, she, you know, um, there is a particular a very uh, truncated writing of the history of American feminism. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that history. I think, for instance, that it, it's very easy to uh, erase the presence of socialist and Marxist women of color and black women. Mm -hmm. And that's what she does. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we don't exist, that we haven't done this work, you know, around, at the same time that white women were doing this work. So this, so part of it, I think, is really how one writes history. Now, the critique of neoliberal feminism, is there a critique to be made? Of course there's a critique to be made. And, you know, one couldn't, most of us couldn't sit in the academy and not see that there is a critique that needs to be made about careerism, about complicity, you know, about domestication, all of that. But that, I, I wouldn't collapse that with uh, Nancy Fraser's position. Mm. No, I think the, the, the reason why there was this feeling that there was a convergence of positions is both of y'all uh, quite strongly critique post-structuralist, post-modernist feminism. And that's where perhaps there was this feeling yeah. that they, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you might, the, the, the positions might converge. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, again, you've given me two very important points and then I'll, like I said, invite you all. I know there are a lot of people impatient to uh, ask their questions, but you, you, you use two words, domestication and insurgent uh, epistemologies. And uh, what, how can we safeguard um, uh, from, from insurgent epistemologies becoming appropriated, co-opted in this, you know, feminist globality. Of course, yes. we, we do, we are invested and we are, um, uh, you know, fighting for, uh, for globalizing feminism. At the same time, we don't want insurgent epistemologies to be assimilated into a Eurocentric feminism. So, um, and you yourself talk about the citational politics, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, that Mohanty is cited and then it's taken care of. We have post-colonial studies and we've, we've taken care, we, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's somebody very nicely put it, at post-colonial feminism and stir. Right. And then the project is, um, you it's know, we, 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 we are good. So how do we, how do we safeguard against this kind of appropriation of what you also call the epistemic privilege yes. of marginalized um, uh, women and of communities. Right. So I would, I, I'd say two ways. My first response uh, very often to um, these forms of institutional appropriation, which is what they are, is that those of us who see it happening need to point it out and we need to organize. We need to actually organize in the academy, I think. It is too easy, and I think your experience bears that out, Nikita. <laughs> it is too easy for individual scholars to be marginalized and erased and everything else, domesticated. And what is necessary is collectivity in organizing. Sometimes that's not possible, mm -hmm. which I also know. You know, and if nothing else, my decades in the U.S. Academy has really taught me sure. that. You know, sure. so um, so I think that you there is no way you can prevent the assimilation and appropriation of uh, experiences. I mean, this is this is what colonial history is. What else is it? Mm -hmm. No. This is what, the, we have centuries of appropriate. I mean, some, they went into India and took our, what, jewel, you know, jewels. That's one appropriation. Now it's ideas, experiences, you know, theoretical perspectives. So I, I don't think one can change that since one lives in a space uh, and the academy is very much a part of it, of a, a capitalist profit-making, you know, consumer system which creates uh, 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 discourses which don't have, we don't have to be connected to embodied experiences anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So, so that's going to happen, I think. Um, can we prevent it? I don't know if we can prevent it, um, but we can fight back against it, I guess would be the answer. And we could organize to, um, you know, just to make those. One of the things I do, I, I'm very committed to pedagogical strategies. So a lot, I, I, I think that I, a lot of my writing comes from trying things out in a classroom and from uh, conversations in a classroom. And so one of the kinds of projects I have had students do is to produce a, a state of the college or state of the university report as a coll collaborative, collective project where students uh, do research on various aspects of their own university. And so you look at how power and, and uh, inequity runs through various forms of governance in the institution, you look at the curriculum, you look at it, and you, and then you make it public. Oftentimes, students can say things that faculty cannot say. As the poster here, campus racism already points out, yep. this is already being done by students in Frankfurt. Yep. So, a little applause for them. <laughs> okay. You've been. You've been very patient, so now I'd like to invite you all to uh, pose your questions for Chandra. And we have two volunteers here who will bring the mic to you all. So please wait till the mic reaches you, the microphone reaches you. There at the back. Well, first, let me thank you for your very inspiring thought. Um, one of the many things that struck me was how your talk framed the relationship between borders and social theft. Uh, specifically because I'm trying to understand at the moment how that is at work in terms such as anchor babies. Yes. So I think it's a very, very um, contemporary thing. However, um, as some Afro-pessimist authors such as Sajid Hartman or Frank Willison would argue, um, the concept of social death can only be used for the analysis of anti-blackness because the fungibility of migrants would be limited by their deportability. So I would like to know what your views on this are and how that would impact the analysis of border and social life and their relation. Thank you. Okay, I, need, I, I didn't hear the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, it was, could you, it could you, uh, the, the, I don't know if it's if acoustics it's in the yeah. room, okay. but there were parts uh, which one I'm got and parts which we uh, didn't. So didn't could you, I'm okay, sorry so to uh, make you repeat the question just, again. I'll just, re yeah. I think you need to hold it. Uh, Closer uh, maybe. Does it work yeah. like this? Yeah. Better? Yeah, yeah better. Okay. that's better. Um, what I said is that... Um, and, and slow, I know I, I'm the last person who can ask anybody else. <laughs> okay. Exactly, me too. But yeah, I try. go slow. I try. So, um, um, as I said, I think this relationship between borders and social death is very interesting. However, some authors, such as Frank Wilson or Sadia Hartman, might argue that social death can only be used for the analysis of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. because the fungibility of the migrant would be limited by their deportability and their ultimate um, connection to what would be a homeland in a specific sense. Mm -hmm. And my question would be what your views on this are on, and how that would impact the analysis of the relationship between borders and social death. Okay. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I guess I'm not, um, I, I'm not sure I would actually understand why Saidiya Hartman would make that point. Is it because, uh, is the anti-blackness have to do with quit particularly African Americans? That's what we're talking about? Uh, the long array of anti-black slavery, particularly. Right, okay, because I'm saying, because you know, there are Africans who are uh, part of the argument I'm making and would fit. So, so I'm not, so again, I guess part of it is the spe specification of blackness. Um, it, so just to get back to your question, okay. um, so um, they would say that the difference between the African black people and the African Americans is that the African Americans through the Middle Passage lose their home right. country. Right. So that would be different from the post-colonial matrix you would have with black Africans. Right, right. So, you know, I completely uh, agree with the fact that there are different uh, ways of thinking about um, home, identity, and marginality in these contexts, right? In the same way as I've heard this argument made, for instance, um, by 
uh, African Americans in relation to indigenous people, for whom they, you know, indigenous people who talk about settler colonial politics in the United States and the loss of land, right? So the same argument has been used by African Americans who say, well, but we never, you know, what, what land is not something that we can, all of which to me makes sense, but these are conceptual issues, these are um, issues, theoretical, analytic uh, issues that one could struggle, uh, struggle with, but on the ground, how much will they matter in terms of being allied with certain kinds of struggles? I don't know. And oftentimes for me, the, it's the sort of praxis that really shows what people, um, you know, under what um, umbrellas people actually can come together. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it's, not, it, uh, it's both and. I'm, I'm both agreeing with that position and then saying, well, that position works at the level of trying to do an analysis of it. But what I've also seen on the ground is that it, in fact, isn't. Um, and the more one defines these minute differences, the more one loses common differences, I think, also. Sometimes, in some cases, I've seen that as well. And I say this because Saidiya is actually my sister. I mean, I know her, I've worked with her, etc. So it's not, you know. I hope I haven't overlooked people. I don't have anybody on the list. You all must have things to say. Yeah. <laughs> Kira? Yeah. Thanks so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I was. Um, Thinking about your point in relation to uh, the European Union, how to think about border zones there. Mm -hmm. And um, what I was thinking was that in the European case, it's particularly important to think about the exterritorialization of borders, mm -hmm. that in fact, a lot of what is going on isn't actually even visible in any particular zone, but mm. is being sort of transferred actually to countries of emigration in particular. Huh. So about one year ago, we had the Khartoum Protocol in which European governments made agreements with uh, the leaders of authoritarian regimes in uh, Sudan, South Sudan, and Eritrea, and, and other uh, African countries in order to build up policing capacities, right? And while the argument was very much a humanitarian one in terms of, well, nobody wants to see people die uh, crossing the sure. Mediterranean, right? right? The purpose was very much to prevent people from, from. getting out. Right. Even though, you know, when Eritreans actually get to Germany, the, um, they're, they're almost, um, all of them uh, get a status as, uh, as refugees here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that points toward the need to maybe conceptualize those border Absolutely. zones, not in sort of narrow territorial terms, but also... Absolutely. Uh, discuss them more widely, so mm -hmm. that was just the point. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Anna? So uh, my, my question is uh, more or less exactly to this point, which is the question of um, how a question of strategy mm -hmm. for um, resistance and for politicization of these borders. Because I took, I took the, I mean, one of the, the many things that you revealed throughout the talk was the intersection of securitized nationalism, or in this case of the EU, and neoliberal capitalism. And these are things that, um, we need to work in the face of these things, but they're often, as, as, as she said, quite invisible and different to capture mm -hmm. in terms of visibility or dif difficult to capture sometimes conceptually. And so, and, and I also agree that this is very fitting, the, the tendencies that you mapped out through the three examples also in the EU with, the, with doubling down on competition, on you know, balanced budgets, cutting social spending in the EU right. at the same time that we see the election of r radical right-wing parties mm -hmm. and the rise of anti-Muslim racist discourse. Right. And so there's the, we see the matrix you know, 
in so many different places. And so my, my question, especially because of the externalization of the border that the, the previous question um, made note of, is what, what examples have, have you found of successful strategies of revealing these types of um, problems that are often out of view? And, and one thing that, that was obviously public knowledge that, that happened in, in, in the EU was this picture of the, Tur or sorry, of the Syrian, Syrian Im immigrant who washed upon the shore right. of, of Turkey and that became, you know, it was politicized in every which way, became ultra moralized, but right. then it, it kind of sunk out. But it was a rallying point for some activists. And so, uh, so th there's a case of photography art, et cetera, what, what examples or modes of politi politicization do you see as helpful given the invisibility? Right. Well, I mean, I think that uh, clearly what is possible through social media now seems uh, extraordinary compared to even a decade ago. Um, whether I have actually you know, uh, any strategies to point to is a whole question that maybe the entire audience needs to take on. You know, there might be people who have ideas who have examples of this. But I think about, um, for instance, what is it that uh, the uh, Zapatistas did? What did the Zapatistas do? It could have been a really small, localized struggle in Chiapas, right? However, that they were so brilliant strategically that they not only were able to, um, and I thought some of the moves were kind of interesting because they never claimed, they always claimed uh, the nation, okay? So they never claimed that we are not part of Mexico. They always claimed we, we are Mexican. And that was an interesting and important strategy for what they were able to mobilize and do. Um, but, so, so I think that that is a very, good example of what um, kinds of information and discourses and um, strategic alliances were built at that moment to get global world attention and um, how that had a major impact. Now, did they, quote, win everything they want? No. You know, and that's actually rarely the case given the world one lives in right now. Um, but I think that there are moments of, um, moments where you can point to particular local movements that have, in fact, mobilized mass support. And there are a lot of the work that has been done around NAFTA in the US, across borders in Mexico and the US and Canada, um, a lot of the work that has been done around the pipeline, you know, that, so there are alliances that have been working. Um, none of them, I think, lead to the kind of deep level change that we are looking for. And for me, that's, I mean, and partly, I think I'm an educator because I feel like without a particular kind of sustained political education, whatever strategies we use, without a sustained political education uh, and an ability to reach various audiences, there's very little change that's gonna happen. You know? So it, it, it never does happen uh, with laws and rules and regulations. They're useful, but they're only useful so long as we make use of them in the right way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's a big question and maybe other people have ideas or responses or examples. Hello? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chandra, for your brilliant talk. Um, I just want to come back to um, uh, the, some of the gender dimensions um, of what you were saying about this um, the masculinized um, military, military um, uh, strategies or mm -hmm. regimes and the particular forms of uh, subjectivities that these are engendering. Um, and I think, I mean, it, I, I found it very important that you pointed out to the fact that um, 
in the context of the nation, um, the male is always seen as the protector and the female is always seen as the representer or right. representing the nation. But you were also talking about these, and I, I, I think uh, very shortly, so I would like you to, to say a bit more about this uh, question of um, the, the binaries that are existing in this, um, in this discourse home on the other way, battlefield on, uh, uh, on the other side, civilians and soldiers. And you said that what is happening in, and I think also we see this in, um, in, in the refugee um, encampment at, mm -hmm. the, at the moment, but also on the West Bank and in, in other um, uh, parts uh, of the world you were talking about, that women are confined to the household more mm -hmm. and more through so mm -hmm. these politics of protection right. and the militarized action that go along with it. So I was just wondering whether you see, because you were talking about alliances and hope, but I think these are really um, sites where it is very hard to find allies and, 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 and you know, rally for, 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 for change and right. for different. Right. I, I think that they, in fact, in, there are, um, there are women in those communities who are, in fact, organizing. But they're not as visible. They will not call themselves feminist. And they're not visible in the same way. But they are organizing because they see that they are, in fact, um, not only being confined more, but they are now subjected to much more patriarchal masculinist behavior in the home. So it's not, they're not duped. So they do see that and they do organize. But as I said, it's not, it's not visible in terms of people writing about them or quote, on, you know, whatever. And then it's not, um, then women organizing in the home for their, um, you know, uh, what's it? For their um, land, for their home spaces, to keep um, for their own safety, to not have the men criminalized, etc. All of that is going on, but it's not read as part of a larger politics of fighting for justice in Palestine, for instance. Right? So I think this is, an, I mean, some of what I'm trying to say is that we need a, a really expansive deep feminist analysis here, where it is really about making all of those connections and not allowing ourselves to truncate what it is we want to change. Mm -hmm. Not allowing ourselves that. Mm -hmm. So not giving in to despair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not making, uh, making our project, shrinking our project so much that, and this is neoliberal capital for you, right? So you shrink your project and you get a little crumb, right? And you are like, okay, I have my home now, fine, right? And then, so, and some of it, that's why I'm talking, I also think so much about education because so much of it is demystifying the way power works because power and privilege works by making itself invisible. That is why it works. It make privilege works by making itself invisible, right? Invisible. So you have to undo that. You have to make it visible in order to see it. And that to me is an incredible task that those of us sitting here can do. We have access, we have the privileges of certain kinds of libraries and education, and, but we can't do it if we only sit in our little rooms. If we, if we don't straddle movements, if we don't straddle both the academy and movements and communities outside the academy, I mean, some of what I credit my work with the uh, grassroots organization group that I work with, they work on prison, uh, anti-prison privatization. But I credit them and the work I did in the 90s with my entire mode of thinking around privatization. 
Okay? That's where I learned it. I didn't learn it from reading some theorist. You know, I just literally learned it by working with people who were breaking it down for communities, right, on the ground. And that made complete sense. Otherwise, it becomes a mind game sometimes, you know, and it's, it's so seductive. I love theory. It's completely seductive, mm -hmm. right? But it has to be really connected, and it has to work in, in particular ways. And you have to decide which, who are you committed to? What are the stakes of what you want? What are your stakes in the work you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. What are the communities that you are connected to? Because you're not connected to all communities. That's hard. But hopefully, eventually, all communities would benefit with the work that you do. No? So that's a difference from Nancy Fraser, too. <laughs> Okay, I have five people on my list. Just let me know if I'm missing out uh, somebody, and then I'm going to cluster the questions. There's Andrea on that side. Um, there's, um, I'll, I'll just, I didn't register you. So there's Andrea, um, there's Christina, there's Finney, and then I have uh, Uta and Barbara, and then maybe one last person. Could you tell me your name? You're the only one I don't know. Tanchin? You have an ex. Okay. She has uh, an example. Uh, I'll put you on the list. Can you give me your name? Yeah. Claire. Okay. And I'm closing the list now. I'm sorry, but now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, so I'm going to do clusters of three. I mean, mm -hmm. first three and then four. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm closing the list. Okay. So let's start with Andrea. And I'd, I'd like to kindly request you all to keep your uh, questions a bit uh, short and uh, concise. And I will be concise and short. Too. Um, I have to come back to the concept of common differences because we were discussing um, the afternoon after reading your three texts. Um, if um, Andrea, could you stand up? It would help. I can't see you. It would help. Thank so, you. Ah, thanks. Hello. Um, so we were um, asking if this common or how how is like the step to come to common difference practices. Maybe if I can formulate it that way, because um, from my perspective, and I think from many of, of the discussions in the afternoon, um, this umbrella of common difference is not always enough in order to mm -hmm. develop this common. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm talking about experiences, for example, in Latin America, there's always this uh, and uh, feminist encounters where a lot of feminist groups right. uh, uh, meet. And sometimes uh, after these encounters, they have a huge difference, so they are not able to talk anymore with each mm -hmm. other. And mm -hmm. other times, maybe some things are reached, but uh, it's very difficult to find like this step in order to to find the common. So from the examples and from the work you've done with uh, these groups, can you maybe mention that this ingredient that brings the common um, within the, in this umbrella? Christine? Um, I'm also very thankful and I found your lecture really inspiring. Um, I would like you, I have two questions. Um, I really liked your, connect, uh, your connection to wars and wars and borders. And you also called it um, anti-imperialist feminism. And I would really like to know what you mean by that because you were also quoting Arundhati Roy's work on empire. So do you, what, what, what is your notion of anti-imperialist feminism? Is it like in the 19th or 20th century? Or do you relate to the concept of empire like Arundhati Roy does it? And how is, the, how is it then related to gender relations and also anti-capitalism? Because I'm still not sure how the connections are. And then um, I, I, I was also thinking, um, you, quote, uh, you quoted um, Angela Davis, the 21st century as a century of migration. I also refugee have, movement. Refugees. Oh, refugee, okay. Is this really, because I must say, um, in a lot of migration studies, I think um, especially the anti-capitalist uh, moment is missing a little bit. So do you have an idea how we can connect that? And my last one would be, um, you talked about careerism. 
sorry, in feminist or in the connection to feminist studies, how would you uh, draw out that connection? You cheated. You asked me three questions. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, I'll just take this one. Yeah, go for it. Um, Because it's just yes. logistically faster. Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, I was wondering, and maybe it's a bit of a naive question, but it's a thing I'm struggling currently with because it's all nice and I understand that the political system is wrong and you were all also talking about the homeland security of removing all removable aliens. Mm -hmm. But I feel now it's also here in Germany, there is not only, of course, it's also related with politics and right-wing parties, but there is a population growing on which does that kind of job or which wants to do that job on a very right-wing position where they want to defend their country and try to be a patriot, which apparently the political system is not even doing because they let refugees and migrants in, which will be potential terrorists. Sure. And I'm thinking, it's yes, it's all nice, but then I feel also we're in a bubble because most of us are not from this side and I have difficulties w how to approach this, you know? It's not only on a state level now, I would say, but it also moved in into this level of yeah, more citizens, which is, I think, a number now which we cannot just ignore and say they're crazy, you know? Cause, sure. Yeah, so that's just one approach, yeah. Uh, you, we, you respond to these and then I do this last last round. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, wait. Just okay. For the yeah. second. Wait for the second round. Hmm? Wait, uh, wait for the last round. Okay. okay. So um, very quickly, the common differences question. Um, first of all, it's not about um, creating common differences within feminisms. I never see just. I'm not just working with feminist groups. First of all. So it depends on how, what the object is, what the framework is, what the goal is of what you want to be organizing for. Then you need to think about which are the sets of people that you would be aligned with. And they're not, I mean, f feminists have internal struggles and you know, immigrants have internal struggles, but I'm not going to say I only organize within feminist movements, within immigrant movements. That's not, and I think we can't be thinking like that at all. So how do you build commonality? You build commonality through some real hard work in first figuring out who are the sets of people that in fact you can make common cause with, that makes sense for the issue and the context on the ground. And then you do the hard work of just pushing and, um, I don't know, talking. And the only, that's my only answer because I try to do this all the time in my everyday life in the academy, which let me tell you is really hard. So, um, but I've seen organizers that I work with do this. And they don't, they don't um, think about the landscape within which they organize as bounded in a particular way. And I think that would be my answer, that you, one tries to think more broadly. One tries to think out of the box about common differences. Does it make sense? It's what um, Angela sometimes calls unlikely coalitions. Okay, so, and to me that, that's politically, that is how it works. Okay. Now, anti-imperialist feminism. Um, anti, you know, I use, I, I use it sometimes as a big term for uh, a feminism that is decolonial, anti-imperial, anti-capitalist, anti-racist. Sometimes I will say it all and sometimes I will use this. But anti-imperialist very specifically now because in the context in which I'm describing it, we're talking about so-called democracies that claim themselves to be these incredible democracies in their regions. Think of what Israel claims for itself. Think of what India claims for itself and what the US claims. So these are countries that claim to be superior democracies to everybody else around them. 
Well, they're not. They're imperial democracies. And so they need a particular kind of anti-imperialist analysis, which a lot of people, let me tell you, in the US do not do, okay? People do not do. I mean, people in the US can do anti-racist, but they're not anti-imperialist. So the, the question of citizenship and nation, I guess, is what brings in the anti-imperialist feminism that I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you asked me two or three other questions. Okay. Let's see. Um, something about refugee. Yeah. So the refugee movement, I think that when Angela says the refugee movement, she is talking about an anti-capitalist perspective on the refugee movement. Mm -hmm. But I think what your question suggests is that maybe that isn't how it is viewed or how it is seen in, in public culture or something. And so then that is something that one needs to think through. What are the, the forms of economic political dispossession and um, profit making that are tied to dispossession of lands, etc. right? So for instance, the World Bank has all this stuff about economic dispossession. Right? That has to be brought together now with you know, dispossession due to war or et cetera. Okay, third question, something about career, careerism. What do you want me to say about it? Like, I mean, what's your, what's your real question? I see. No, 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 that's the big question. So we'll talk when I can have some, a glass of wine outside. Okay. All right. So, um, there was and your question. Your question somebody else should answer because I think people, someone who has seen, I know what you're asking. You're, you're saying it's not just the state. We are now talking about the mobilization of right-wing fascist movements on the ground that in fact are doing the work of the state very often and doing more than the work of the state very often as well. So how do you address them? Mm. I mean, I think that it's, it's the question for all uh, spaces, all cultures. I mean, we do this with Hindu fundamentalists mm. who are driving us all mad. I mean, so that's, that is, these are struggles that people are fighting on the ground and people are organizing and uh, pushing back. So I, my, my very superficial response to you is find those people. <laughs> is find the people and the groups who are pushing back against this kind of mobilization against refugees. Mm. Okay, very quickly, we're really running out of time. Uta? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Chanda. I think many of the questions somehow touch the point of um, inherent contradictions. Mm -hmm. And mine also points into that direction. Um, Amongst many things you raised, I was very convinced at first listening about your point of um, the way of human, humanitarian and religious framing of all kinds of good arguments, so to say. On the other hand, looking at our very own context here in Frankfurt, we all know how much the global justice talk fits into, um, mm. let's say, a very liberal, if not to say neoliberal way of um, rethinking the world. Mm -hmm. And with respect to um, um, what we face at the moment um, in terms of um, refugee solidarity politics on the ground, I was wondering um, how to deal with humanitarianism and um, sometimes religious arguments, which in a way we urgently need to come back to some kinds of ethical standards. Mm -hmm. Even though I, I was fully convinced about your argument, it is only leading me to that point. Who, do you have any idea yeah, how to respond to these kinds of inherent um, contradictions we always touch when we think about common differences, building alliances, solidarity questions, and mm -hmm. alike. Barbara? Um, thank you. 
Um, I'm wondering about the place of accountability in your entire account. And I was um, struck by a certain kind of asymmetry in the way that you presented sort of the different sides. Um, when you talk about the neoliberal capitalist kind of state, you talk about it very, um, let's call it systemically. Mm -hmm. um, and about sort of subjectivities being created, right, sort of passive tense in, in a sense. When you talk about activists, you're talking about real life people who are taking these actions. Um, and um, I think in some of your writing you talk about feminist theorists being um, accountable to uh, minority communities, indigenous communities. And I'm wondering about accountability on the other side, right? On the, on the sort of, is there, is that just sort of a hopelessly idealist notion that you know there ought to be accountability there as well, um, or is there is there some progress to be made on that side? So accountability. Wait, sorry. I don't know. You just got um, Yeah, accountability on the other side, meaning on the side of activists. Or? No, on the side of the the state, the representatives of mm. the states, you know, ah. the, the people who are actually coming up with um, the documents in Paris, mm. that kind of thing, right? So you talked about um, forms of violence being justified from within the sure. neoliberal framework. Um, um, let's see what, um, s things being seen as rational right. uh, in the context of the war on Absolutely. terror, right? Um, but. I think most of us in this room would want to say, well, they're not, right? These, no. are, these yeah. are not actual justifications, sure. right? They're misjustifications, yeah. if anything. That's the kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Fina? And uh, Claire, last but not least. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, you talked very briefly about the appropriation and co-optation of uh, feminist discourses in a sort of corporate academy within neoliberal hegemony. Um, and I really love that your answer was, uh, we have to organize. Um, and I think it's um, very interesting for us here at Goethe University and our current struggles, the struggles of the Hilfskräfte especially, and our strike on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should all come, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on how these kind of organizations or how, how, what did you mean by organizing within the academy? Did you also mean including the students, including, uh, including the non-academic employees and so on? Maybe you could just elaborate on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So you might be pleased to know this isn't a question. I just wanted to share with you, but you might already know the group. They're called the Libro Traficantes. They're book smugglers and they're out of Houston, Texas. Uh -huh. And they came together in 2012, March 2012, to take the books back to the students in Arizona. HB 22 rendered a Mexican-American studies program illegal mm -hmm. in Tucson, Arizona, saying that the um, program was trying to bring about the overthrow of the American government and to <laughs> cause dissent and to separate the races. And the books were taken away from the children when the children were in the classrooms. And they were locked away in the libraries and underground um, and underground tunnels pretty much in, in Tucson, Arizona. And the kids chained themselves to death to stop this and the kids were called rude and unruly and they were arrested. And the Liwa Traficantes were in Houston, Texas. There were a group called Nuestra Palabra, then Our Word. It was a literature and literacy group. And they've been running for about 10 years to give voices to the peoples, the Latino peoples of Houston. And they heard what had happened and they knew because they already had networks. They'd already built networks because only art can save us, right? So they heard about it and they thought, what can we do? What can we do? And one of them said, we'll take the books back. Mm -hmm. So they got a caravan and they filled the caravan with the books <laughs> donated from the authors such as San Cisneros. Um, and the books on the, um, on the bibliography were the very canon of Chicano, Latino, African-American, feminism, um, literature. Bell Hooks um, was, on, was on there. Richard Baldwin was on there. Sonos Cisneras was on there. Mm -hmm. William Shakespeare was on there. <laughs> the Tempest, huge outcry of a Mr. Shakespeare, but not of much anybody else. So they traveled and one week, a, a traveling collective of 36 writers, artists, poets, musicians, and they traveled from Houston to San Antonio, and they, they formed in front of the Alamo, and Lorna de Cervantes read in front of the Alamo, and she read her poem, poem to a young white man who asked me why I believed in war between the races. Mm -hmm. And they moved from there to the United Farm Workers, to the Southwest Workers Union, 
and they had a party. And they moved from there to El Paso, to La Mejero Brera, an incredible space of Latina garment workers who'd lost everything because of NAFTA. And they moved from there into New Mexico, and they moved from there into Arizona. And they took the books back to the kids. And they're still together, they're still a unit. And they have connections, political connections, media connections, film connections, um, literary connections. They have connections, they're now in Paris. They're at the COP21 in Paris, fighting there too, because a lot of their members are in, from the indigenous communities who can't cross the border without a piece of paper that somebody's told them makes them something or renders them invisible. So there are groups, the Libro Traficantes, LibroTraficante.com. <laughs> They're an amazing group of people, five of them, and they took names. Tony Clay, Pierce. you're going to get yeah? me into big trouble. Okay. <laughs> but they took names. They took names. They took names. They said, if we're arrested, you give this name. El Vivo Traficante, High Tech Aztec. Lips Mendez. If you're arrested, you give these names. You don't give your own names because they will not recognize our names here. Yeah. LibroTraficante.com. I should end. Thank you. We should end there. That was... <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a really good note to end, but and I think uh, the, the ones who questions. Ask the questions very quickly. Okay, okay very quickly. So, um, Anna, the question about. Anna? Uh, uh, Uta? Not, no, you want no, to start I was, with I was actually going Finne. to Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think, yes, I think when I say organize, I mean organize um, all the various constituencies in a university setting um, that. Uh, would be allies in what it is that you're asking for in terms of whatever transformation. Yes. So yes, absolutely, and um, hopefully we'll have time to talk more about this. Um, Uta, um, so I'm trying to um, figure out how to internal contradictions and how one um, works with them. I think in many ways it's, um, it's this notion of unlikely coalitions, I think, which is you live with some of the things you disagree with, but given the issue on the ground that you need to work with, I mean, there is no pure struggle. There is no pure or high moral ground I don't think, in most struggles. So you have to negotiate it, I think, in a way that, so there might be some, quote, religious groups, humanitarian groups that one does work with. I mean, I would be the first to say you can't actually just not do that, given, for instance, the history of the civil rights movement and, and the black church in it. Now, does that mean that the, the patriarchy and the sexism and all of that stuff of the black church doesn't exist? No. In fact, it exists and has been criticized, right? Um, but uh, does it also, do you also not acknowledge that there is a form of mobilization that was crucial to the movement that was played by the church? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's the simple answer, but it's a deep question. I think one has to continually think about it because at what moment do you become complicit, right? At what moment does your politic become domesticated, right? So what do you stand on and what are the, uh, you know, what do you give up for the larger issue? I mean, those are all, I think, questions for each of us to kind of figure out. Yeah. And last but not least, the question of accountability and the state. Uh. So, so um, I think, yes, it's important to think about accountability. And sometimes I tend to just write off a bunch of people. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? As people who will never listen to me, people who will actually not hear what I have to say. And then I decide, I, honestly, I make decisions about what sets of people am I most effective with? Right? And where can I intervene? Because honestly, I really want, no one can in fact work at all kinds of levels. So, but are there people, are there lobby groups, are there people applying pressure at that level? Yes, so you have somebody like a Mary Robinson working in the COP21 group, you know, pushing for certain important things. So there are people doing that stuff at various levels. 
Um, and for me, it's again, it's this question of scale that I began with. So what is the scale at which one works? And who are the people one can talk to? And why is it that the people who hear you have to also pay attention to a questions of accountability and complicity? Because that's a really, to me, it's a very big deal in the US Academy right now, because there's a lot of stuff being done in my name. you know. And then there's a lot of stuff that I do that, that people don't like. So then they vilify me for that as well. And then that keeps me honest, I figure. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's using my privilege as somebody who is tenured in the US Academy to, in fact, do certain kind of work that I'm not the only one doing. So again, I can never claim that you know, I'm doing this on my own. If I was on my own, you know, I'd be like dead and gone a long time ago. I mean, the, the, the figures around women of color, the revolving door for women of color faculty in the US are phenomenal. And here, you all don't even have women of color on the faculty here. I mean, talk about work that has to be done here. This is like serious work, you guys, you all need to do. On that note, let's go and get some wine. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.